With upwards of 35,000 students, the University of California, Berkeley, is big. Now, there is power in numbers, but along with that power, there comes great responsibility. That's a responsibility towards campus climate and diversity. My name is Rodolfo Mendoza Denton. I'm a psychology professor here at UC Berkeley and your co-host for today alongside Dri Cavusi, fourth year undergraduate and ASUC senator. To talk about campus climate and diversity, we have three distinguished guests. First, Victoria Robinson, director of the American Culture Center here at UC Berkeley. Lisa Walker, director of cross-cultural student development, also at UC Berkeley and Juana Maria Rodriguez, Professor of Gender and Women's Studies. To each of you, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so incoming students usually have to take something called an AC, mm -hmm. or an American Cultures Requirement, and you work at the American Culture Center. Can yeah. you explain what that is or where right. it comes from? Right. The American Culture Center is um, it's a small entity, it's just two people, so mm -hmm. often centers are small, big in name and small in, in, in stature. Um, the American Cultures Requirement was created over 25 years ago and it came out of political mobilizations that we hold as decolonial struggles that were really aimed at an anti-apartheid movement and there was a lot of um, political mobilization that then made its way into demands here on the campus to democratize the curriculum, to recognize that there was a real gap between the demography of the students and what they were learning which really was not a democratized education around race and ethnicity. So we've now got a 25-year-old curriculum where every student at Berkeley has the opportunity to engage in a classroom setting where race, ethnicity, and the complexities of culture, sexuality and gender, legal status, national origins, are put into play together and the students get the opportunity to work and talk with the faculty and other students about those complexities. Phenomenal. Thank you. So additionally, there is a gender and women's studies department. Mm -hmm. You have your hand in that, Juana. Yeah, um, I teach in gender women's studies, and right now I'm also teaching an American cultures class. And I think you know part of what uh, this 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 semester, for example, we've done a lot of really difficult topics. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about lynching, we've talked about torture, we've talked about you know mm -hmm. sexual violence, and we, we're thinking about how to frame um, issues that are really important in students' lives, but give them a kind of historical depth, give them a, a kind of opportunity to really study these as topics, as, as moments of, uh, of inquiry and interrogation, not just in their own lives, but you know, what are the historical precedents for these, these things. And what AC course do you teach in Gender and Women's Studies? Right now, I'm teaching a course called Gender, Race, and Justice, in which we look at the ways in which race and gender are really foundational to our understanding of the American legal system. All right, and then what is the Cross-Cultural Student Development Center? Yeah, Cross-Cultural Student Development is one office of uh, a hallway of offices. Mm -hmm. Uh, multi, that are called multicultural student development. So I work in the cross-cultural element, although all of our work is very cross-cultural. And uh, my neighbors are ethnic-specific spaces. Mm -hmm. We're also close partners with the Multicultural Community Center and with the Gender Equity Center. And that's, where is that all located? Um, most of those spaces I just named are on the second floor of Chavez. Okay. And what I would say, you know, what are we about? We're about um, being spaces where students can plug into doing the actual work of mm -hmm. supporting and engaging both in a particular community and across communities. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the uh, important roles that this course is playing is to give access uh, to students to centers such as the ones that you mentioned. I'm wondering if you have at your fingertips the websites that might be associated with your centers mm -hmm. or perhaps the best uh, name to type in a kind of search engine. Mm -hmm. um, I would type in multicultural to the campus homepage, mm -hmm. and you'll pro and I believe what will come up are all of the close partners that I named, and certainly the Multicultural Community Center. Mm -hmm. I also want to really suggest that students just walk by the spaces mm -hmm. and just drop in, introduce themselves. Um, over my years, I've seen that's a really great way for students to become personally involved mm -hmm. or to really know what's happening in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And really quickly, before we move on to the uh, to the web presence of the AC curriculum. Um, can you name some of the other spaces uh, in that Cesar Chavez second floor? Yeah, so um, 
my neighbors are Native American student development. All mm -hmm. of these offices have a student development tagline, so I'll just use the prefix, mm -hmm. which would be Asian Pacific American, African American, Chicano Latino, Native American, mm -hmm. um, along with cross-cultural. And then right around the corner on the same floor is Gender Equity Center, mm -hmm. which also includes um, LGBTQ programs, sexual harassment education programs, women empowerment programs. Mm -hmm. And we're in a building with a lot of really interesting uh, services to meet a lot of needs mm -hmm. for students. Mm -hmm. One quick question. Where is your department located? We're uh, located on the sixth floor of Barrows. And so we share that floor with uh, the Department of African American Studies, the Center for the Study of Sexual Cultures, the Center for Race and Gender. Uh, mm -hmm. On the fifth floor of Barrows is Ethnic Studies. So in a way, we are similarly, mm -hmm. um, have wonderful uh, relations with our neighbors. And so um, the Center for Race and Gender, I think, is, is a wonderful place that hosts series of, of talks and invited lectures and opportunities for undergraduates, including research opportunities. And so I think it's important to think of both sides in terms of individual students receiving support, but also understanding that these are intellectual projects, mm -hmm. that there is an academic component that is not just about studying yourself, but about studying uh, history, culture, psychology, sociology, architecture. All of those things have uh, components that relate to questions of gender, uh, ethnicity, sexuality. Mm -hmm. What about the AC Center? The AC Center is in Stevens Hall, mm -hmm. and um, that's a recent movement, actually, but it's a beautiful building to be in. Stevens Hall is really proximate to the Ethnic Studies Library, so we're really happy that we have our colleagues mm -hmm. there. But also there's a new partnering of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, mm -hmm. which is on the third floor of Stevens, and the American Culture Center, which is just underneath. And I think that that is something that is pretty unique to find at Berkeley and that I hope people look to find, which is the partnering of great research um, units that Juana Maria also re um, recognized with the Center for Race and Gender and the undergraduate curriculums. And those kind of partnering spaces really do broach the theoretical, the practical and engage graduate, undergraduate students and the faculty together. So yes, you can find us in Stevens Hall, but we have a hashtag, uh, hashtag Berkeley. A-C-E-S, ACES, which I can share more about soon. Thank you, and we'll put that in the supplemental material for this course. Thanks. So quickly to summarize, Stevens Hall, Cesar Chavez, Barrows Hall, mm -hmm. the three wonderful spaces that our students who are interested in these issues can all turn to. So I wanna continue on and discuss climate, because I know that's a big issue. You know, incoming students come in, climate, weather, what are, what are we talking mm -hmm. about with climate? So specifically, you know, I hear often, I treat everyone the same. I'm not racist or sexist. Why, why do we have classes surrounding these issues? Why are we focusing on this issue? Wasn't pointing out the differences gonna make it worse? What do you all have to say? Well, I think that uh, one of the things, right now I'm teaching a class uh, on law. And so you can look at things uh, colorblind law. Mm -hmm. We think of the law as being colorblind, and yet the effects can very often be very racialized, and we see that in drug sentencing. We certainly see that just by watching the news every day. And so mm -hmm. um, part of what uh, we, we hope to think about and talk about is what are those moments where uh, perhaps in theory, right, Everyone's treated the same, but we know from, um, from the world around us that that's really just not the case. And so what are those underlying mm -hmm. uh, issues and what are some of the structural issues that come into play? Juan, if I could just ask for an example of s such a scenario in the law context. You know, um, child farm workers. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there are fabulous laws that protect, that protect child workers. Um, you can't work in McDonald's when you're 14. Mm -hmm. But 12-year-olds can work picking strawberries, mm -hmm. and they can work 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. They can work 50 hours a week, as long as it's not during school hours. So the law itself is colorblind, it applies to mm -hmm. everyone, and yet we know that the majority of the, 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 the young children working in fields are Latino. So that's one example. Uh, mm -hmm. Sentencing around crack and cocaine was certainly another one. Well, and to kind of build off what um, Juana Maria is offering around the, 
the racialized, gendered, and codified ways in which kind of child labor gets presented is that you can imagine a, a student on campus coming from those backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And then we were in conversation the other day about choices being made around certain kinds of visual references mm -hmm. to, um, to products like coffee perhaps or, or um, um, nutritional diets around grapes. And then you see the kinds of bodies that get represented as picking those fruits. And for certain students on the campus, that triggers a certain relationship of, you know, please don't romanticize, fetishize, hold on to a certain kind of laboring in the fields that actually for my reality has been extremely fraught. And so campus climate in some ways as an idea, an umbrella, a hold all, we hope holds accountable our, our deep thinking around those connections. Yeah, I, I would just like to speak also from the perspective, a lot of my work is, outside, is with students outside of their classroom experience, which mm -hmm. of course is central. But you know, it, it, to make it personal, when you say, you know, I don't see, you know, like if you say to me, Walker, I don't see you as black, then my response to that is that you're not seeing part of who I am right. and part of who I'm bringing to the conversation that we're having. Mm -hmm. So when you say there are, I think you said 35,000 students coming to Berkeley, mm -hmm. you know, we can hold an awareness that we're all arriving here with different um, levels of experience talking about what our identities mean to us and how they show up in our mm -hmm. lived experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the impacts of that can be that in a camp, when, you, when we think about campus climate, that we not intentionally, um, you know, so we could say like, I, I see all folks the same and I, w we might wish that that were true, mm -hmm. but the truth is that we've grown up in a society that has mm -hmm. formed, my opinion has formed our perspective. And so now we find ourselves a community of 35,000 students. How do we engage and talk about our differences? And for me, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the great opportunity that's mm -hmm. present when you arrive here as a student. So Walker, you've spoken about seeing students outside of the classroom environment, and yet the work that you're engaged in very much is in fact within the classroom environment. You mentioned talking about topics including uh, oppression, including very difficult yeah. topics within the classroom context. What's the benefit of approaching difficult topics that are sometimes very personal in an academic mm -hmm. lens? Well, for one thing, it's about understanding the news every day. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think mm -hmm. these are. Um, this is the world that we live in. It's a complex, multi-racial uh, world with a lot of conflict, strife, war, um, and to give students some kind of context to to understand the world around them, um, and also to understand, um, you know. Perhaps it's their, the person that they're sharing a room with in their dorm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things we're talking about, uh, transgender uh, issues in the classroom. And so something that's certainly been in the news, mm -hmm. but is also, you know, what does it mean when you, you can't quite read someone's gender? How does that change the way mm -hmm. you talk to them? And, and why, why does that matter, right? Mm -hmm. So um, those kinds of questions, I think, are also really just intriguing questions mm -hmm. to bring to a classroom to mm -hmm. say, why does gender matter? Why do we need to know what someone's gender is? Mm -hmm. um, and that can really sort of spark a whole set of, of interesting conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, within that classroom setting and outside of the classroom setting, I think I'm hearing a lot of it is this, this intergroup dialogue what, what emphasis, if any, is there on this facilitation of these converse, these hard conversations? You know, that's really a focus for cross-cultural student development. Mm -hmm. One of our um, central programs is engaging students in learning and deepening the skill set that they may, might already arrive with um, around how to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, you know, even just in my experience, I noticed that there are some students who will come to campus and really practice in how to talk mm -hmm. about the issues around social identities, power and privilege. And for some folks, it'll be very new, right? right. So that's the context in which students are trying to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And so something like a structured dialogue where folks can agree on, okay, we're about to step into this kind of a conversation. Here's how we'd like to do that so that we can um, both increase the comfort level, or like maybe get over just that little bit of awkwardness that can shut down so many, com so many conversations um, in order to engage more deeply. Mm -hmm. And how do you recommend students that come in with no experience having conversations like this? 
How did they kind of get well versed in having these tough conversations? Some of it is learning to listen, mm -hmm. I think, and um, understand that you can you may be a learner in that space. Mm -hmm. Is um, the the opportunity to engage in the ideas of differences, however they may manifest themselves, is also an opportunity to learn about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of a stage in the growth of not being competent, but being humble in the experiences that you may encounter is I think something we hope that students will have the opportunity to think and consider as they arrive at Berkeley. Cross-cultural student development. Um, I was on the webpage just recently and I saw a beautiful circle of faces. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the interns, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Yeah, um, um, what a great question, because they're a really amazing group of folks. Mm -hmm. So these are students who are already engaged in doing some level of facilitation around the things that they care about, the communities that they come from, the world that they hope to build and change. Mm -hmm. And together, what we do is we, you know, we think deeply about what gets in the way of the kinds of conversations that we hope folks are having on this campus. And what can we do when we show up to those spaces to make the, that conversation, um, to make the environment right for that conversation? Yeah. We really hold that, you know, and I hope that the folks who are viewing this here, that um, we really hold that folks, they come to it as they are, right? And we try to meet them where they are um, so that there's an opportunity to get past some of the obstacles that we might not even be aware of are between mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. um, so that we can really get to know each other. And I think that's one of the things you get from coming to Berkeley. In mm -hmm. addition to your mm -hmm. academic experience, you get this opportunity to think about this and how that might show up in the rest of your life. Yeah. Feeding into you know, climate in the actual practice, what is it like for a student if on this campus in a marginalized community? Is the administration, is the faculty, are students welcoming? What, what is the state of climate on our campus? Those are some big questions. Yeah. Sadly, I think that many students, they feel alienated. They mm -hmm. feel um, alone. They feel misunderstood. Um, and, you know, sometimes they don't feel supported. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it can be difficult. Um, one, I had one student, she was in my class, and uh, it was an American cultures class, and there was 200 students. Um, but she was an engineering major, a young African-American woman. She said, I love coming to this class just because it's one of the few times that I get to see other faces of color. Yeah. So she's sitting in engineering classes where very often she's the only one. And I think those experiences are really real and can be really painful and difficult. Mm -hmm. That said, I think there are all kinds of support on campus and finding other people that you can talk with, other ways to make community, um, other ways to activate around change um, that can really help, that make you feel like this is your campus, and it's your campus to improve, to make better, to challenge. Um, and so I think campus climate is an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. It's not there yet, mm -hmm. and it's kind of up to all of us, including students, to make it what we want it to be. Victoria, is Campus climate, uh, clearly we've got a long way to go. Is it something that we have hope for here at Berkeley? I think we've got great evidence of the ways in which our students both understand and navigate those kinds of um, gap silences and marginalities that they experience in both the recognition of them being here and also the ways in which the university support their, them wanting to be here. Um, I'm just thinking about two student groups that I feel have really animated my own life here on the campus, mm -hmm. the undocumented students mm -hmm. and also the formerly incarcerated students who, if I mean, all of us have been engaged in various ways with those communities of students that overlap gender and sexuality and race and origins in so many kind of rich and profound ways that you couldn't have imagined five years ago where we would be now mm -hmm. in terms of how they've asked and almost demanded no, they have demanded mm -hmm. the university show up in a way. Mm -hmm. And so they've asked the university to recognize and show up with resources, with um, opportunities to engage, to challenge the dominant rhetoric. And so that we know now, hopefully we know that when somebody's been formally incarcerated, the first thing that we don't say is, what were you in for? Yeah. You know, is that there's this kind of basic deprogramming of the DNA of others and othering that happens that 
we have to engage broadly. And um, it's amazing to see where the students have been in actually making that presence possible. Yeah. Walker, you actually came to the ASCC and talked about a term that I think is really important and it tacks onto this allyship. Mm. Can you explain what it means to be an ally and a good ally? Mm. Um, it's such a rich term and uh, in many ways, especially lately, slightly contested. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think allies, allyship is that practice of um, building your awareness about other experiences and then using the power and privilege that might be present in your own life, in your own identity, mm -hmm. to, um, to address what's, uh, to address, the, address those inequities. And uh, recently, because of the time that we just find ourselves in in mm -hmm. the world, I believe, Lots of folks are writing and blogging about the concept of allyship and really calling out what does good allyship as your, you know, what does that really look like? You know, in preparation for our conversation today, I asked a student, uh, Brittany, in my office, you know, how would you define a good ally? And Brittany said, uh, you know, a good ally is willing to listen and absorb what I'm sharing about my experience. And I'm gonna try to almost directly quote her because she said, because we wouldn't tell you something that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a good ally is able to, um, and it takes courage to be able to hear and witness that story and acknowledge it as a reality that's present, even if it hasn't previously been present for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, we were talking about, um, you know, when does the idea of ally move from a noun to a verb? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, does that mean that there's kind of an advocacy role that the ally plays where there are real stakes on the table, resources to be allocated, decisions to be made, where sometimes there's the question of what am I willing to give up as well as I'm willing to gain in this relationship. Mm -hmm. And those are a real life opportunities, I think, when allyship becomes something that is really verb generated that moves into this advocacy role. And mm -hmm. there's many students that we learn from in terms of presenting that that role on campus. That that makes me that makes me think that um, the spaces that we are talking about um, sometimes are thought about, stereotyped even as exclusively serving the specific students uh, who are labeled in the title and uh, who hold that particular mm -hmm. identity. And yet, as an ally, it it's on you to be able to know those spaces and direct other students to uh, to those kinds of spaces. Mm -hmm. That brings us to the issue of, uh, of privilege, although I see that you wanted to. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things <clears throat> I always want to make clear is, you know, my classrooms are absolutely for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think even when you're, uh, when you're taking a class that you think has to do with your identity, mm -hmm. right? You're mm -hmm. one person. And so mm -hmm. what you're learning is a field. You know, Latino studies is a field. Gender women's studies is a field of inquiry. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just learning mm -hmm. about yourself. It's not even necessarily just learning what an ally is. It's thinking about ideas, mm -hmm. thinking about um, movements, learning. Um, and so I think the space of the classroom is a place where you can actually expand what you know, learn something that um, an aspect of your own history or your own identity um, that might not have been apparent to you. Mm -hmm. What about those students, though, who, who feel a, a tremendous sense that they will not be welcome in particular spaces? Um, I mean, we talk about the idea of democratizing education, uh, but there's the flip side, which is in that democratization, uh, certain students who hold privilege feel marginalized in previously uh, non-existent spaces. How did the, how is the experience of those students? Mm -hmm. hmm. I'm wondering why we ever assumed education should be comfortable. Yeah. Um, I think that there are many ways in which uh, the discomfort that we feel mm -hmm. is attached directly to our privileges, and many of us are often asked to turn up in spaces in which we may feel that we're the outsider. So it's it's not necessarily quid pro quo or an equivalency argument or debate, but I do feel that. The idea of racing or gendering or sexualizing certain spaces of discomfort actually doesn't tell us the whole picture of the engineering student that Juana Maria was just talking about. And the idea of not feeling necessarily like her, her or his full self could turn up in that space of being the only black face in a room where that's the authentic voice that has to get presented. So the discomfort of education is almost, I think, 
um, one that warrants deeper exploration of how we think discomfort is actually present or not present. And thank you for saying that. Actually, it's interesting you bring that up in another segment on student leadership. Uh, the current president, Pavan, mentioned how he himself has felt uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's really made him grow as a person, really mm -hmm. getting uncomfortable instead mm -hmm. of being complacently yeah. comfortable. I mean, you've only got to imagine the, the times in your life where you've really grown. I, are they places where I've known what's coming next or I can predict the, the immediate future? Probably the, the moments of tension where yeah. the questions are the most difficult and the most profound maybe for our own identities and realities. That's where growth happens and in some ways that's our hope of the university to be able to shape those spaces so that we all can encounter these profound difficulties in which emotional, intellectual growth happens. And speaking of difficulty, I know for many students the, the idea of privilege is a really, really packed word. Can one of you explain what the idea of privilege is and the, you know, either the the guilt or the leverage that comes with having privilege? Well, I'll offer a first sentence and I hope um, <laughs> folks will join in. But I would say, you know, I use the Peggy McIntosh definition okay. that privilege are the, um, the unearned benefits that would accrue to me just on the basis of my, that I had no control, you know, I arrive in the world as this black woman and, and, and I do have privileges mm -hmm. and, um, that the privilege are those unearned assets that accrue to me on the basis of my social identities. I didn't do anything to earn them. Okay. And I'm invite folks to add to so that. So that's what people mean mm -hmm. by like, maybe like white male privilege or heterosexual privilege or things like that. That's what people mean when they say that? Well, maybe the, the, normal, the normal narrative framing that goes in front of everything. So okay. the ableisms that we kind of assume in our everyday lives that we don't necessarily feel or think that we have to navigate. The negotiation is limited. In some ways, that feels like it's a, it's a privilege. And how can this privilege lead to intentional or unintentional oppression of folks mm -hmm. specifically on this campus? Mm -hmm. I think the, the assumption, um, it's about having assumptions that everyone else has access to the mm -hmm. same, um, that they move in the world in the same way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if someone uh, is, you know, walking, how that person navigates the sidewalk, mm -hmm. right? literally navigates the sidewalk. Are they walking? Mm -hmm. Who's looking at them? How are they dressed? What does it, what's their experience entering a bank to cash a check? What's their experience mm -hmm. trying to rent an apartment? Uh, what's their experience, you know, how easy or difficult is their name to pronounce, mm -hmm. right? Um, how memorable are they to, to uh, faculty, right? Yep. So th those are these tiny little things mm -hmm. that actually make up a full day, right? So it's these, you know, people call them microaggressions, but these tiny little things that just keep happening that kind of start to wear on you. Can you give an example of a microaggression? Well, um, it's uh, being followed in a store. It's being, um, you know, at calling for an apartment, and if you have a Latino last name, well, how many children do you have? Um, mm -hmm. It's, uh, oh, you speak English so well. Um, mm -hmm. It's um, yeah. making a, assumptions based on what you look like, um, assuming, oh, do you have a boyfriend, right? It's assuming mm -hmm. heterosexuality. Yep. It's, all, it's these kind of ongoing assumptions mm -hmm. about who we're speaking with. And, you know, on our campus, it can be things like, walking through Sather Gate and you see someone handing out flyers and they don't hand you one, yeah. right? Or you're in a classroom and the professor says, okay, everyone get into small groups or discussion groups or choose your study group and, mm -hmm. and you find yourself being the last to be selected um, because perhaps that group is judging who they think you are based on the social identities that they think they can read. How does one, one handle privilege responsibly? Exactly my yeah. question. I think you have to go through the painful process of acknowledging that you have it. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, I just want to acknowledge that that, you know, that that guilt, you mentioned guilt. Mm -hmm. And I think guilt can be like a little bit of a hideout place. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So I, encur I really mm -hmm. encourage folks to just do the personal work of um, doing the learning and the acknowledging, acknowledgement of the privilege that you have. Mm -hmm. okay. And then once you acknowledge it, it's interesting because it will begin to just reveal itself 
repeatedly in your interactions, mm -hmm. if you can stay with it, right? right? If you can not put it away after you check it out. And that's the, yeah, Go that's ahead. the important element is it's the, the, the absence of finality mm -hmm. of that work is the, mm -hmm. the idea of staying with it mm -hmm. and um, like, th that is really tough to be able to stay with those acknowledgements and that, and that work that has to be placed within the privileges. And it's important to acknowledge the difficulty of that, of yeah. that process, of that mm -hmm. ongoing yeah. process. Would you say that uh, academic endeavors into these uh, notions around privilege and oppression help in that process of recognizing and working through uh, what it means? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I would say is just recognizing that if you're in an American literature class and there are very few texts by women authors or authors of, of color, what does that say about what is being presented as American literature, right? Mm -hmm. So um, actually studying these issues mm -hmm. is valuing those experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Taking mm -hmm. a class in um, you know, uh, disability studies or learning about African-American history or um, Native American literature is a way to value those mm -hmm. as, um, as fields of inquiry as knowledge that's worth having, that's understood as part of what constitutes an educated person. And I think the academic relationship has not been additive. Like we've we've moved, thank goodness, past that relationship with, oh, well, here's the normative histories yeah. and let's add on. Right. And therefore that's inclusion yeah. to the idea, no, 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 it's constituent of, constitutive yeah. of. Yeah. And that that really is where I think the Academy has played, played a role to think about the mutuality and responsibility of having that kind of multivocal relationship where exclusions are really kind of called out. Such a complex phenomenon. I wonder if we might uh, briefly touch on some of the resources available to the students uh, who might be watching who are interested in issues around climate, around diversity, around difference. Um, Victoria, as uh, director of the AC uh, Center, um, I'm sure you have a few. I, I do. I, um, I, I've been trepidatious about the ways in which diversity and issues of campus climate come together mm -hmm. in that we can create competencies or diversity trainings. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the realities that manifest themselves are so much deeper and need to be very um, gainfully engaged with in so many different elements. There's one program on campus that, of course, is a bit narcissistic to me called the Engaged Scholarship Program, mm -hmm. the American Cultures Engaged Scholarship Program. And it's an initiative to bring together community organizations with the undergraduate curriculum, with the community as, as vocally an asset mm -hmm. in developing those relationships to the university. And then therefore the students who engage in those relationships with the community get to amplify and engage in ways where um, the complexities of a social issue or social question are not just academic or theoretical, they're really pushed to be engaged in ways that will manifest themselves in a, in a way in the world that is real, practical, and hopefully in the long term transformative. And therefore you can see that students who may also identify themselves from those communities get to show up in the classroom in a different way, mm -hmm. not as an issue to be studied or the sole student who can bring in the authentic voice. And that's the ACES program. It is. Remind me again of what that spells out? The American Cultures Engaged Scholarship Program, hashtag Berkeley ACES. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, again, all these resources are available online. The time absolutely flew by for me. Thank you so much. I do want to end with uh, just one quick moment to um, give you the opportunity to communicate to our viewers the one nugget of information that you would like them to have as incoming students moving forward through their college career at Berkeley. I think one of the things that I would uh, advise students is go out and learn something new. Mm -hmm. uh, take that risk, sign up for a class that you really, wow, I know nothing about you know, um, Islam. Let me go take a class. I know mm -hmm. nothing about this. Let me go study this particular phenomenon. So mm -hmm. we are a university and, and we're good at that. Thank you. Victoria? Mm -hmm. I think you may have been told that you're lucky to be at Berkeley. I think you need to hopefully hold on to the idea we're lucky to have you. And that means that um, you, as you want the university to be here in your life, is something that you should really preface in your relationship. Walker? I would say that no matter where you are when you arrive on this campus, if you're someone who's very experienced talking about different social identities, power and privilege, 
there's an opportunity for you to deepen that and for you to learn how you want to engage folks who are not as experienced. And if you're someone who arrives and even hearing our conversation is, whoa, that's a lot, right? There are a lot of opportunities for you to begin to engage and to figure out what are all these topics that we're talking about so that you're uh, just along with your degree, you have this other experience that I think will just, that's so needed in our world. Thank you. Lisa Walker, Victoria Robinson, Juana Maria Rodriguez. We appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next show.